of the gobble thing before I start. It just dawned on me. After the demons entered the pigs, do you think the pigs could talk? Well, the demons were talking to the guy. I don't know. I'm just asking. Probably. Yeah. That'd be scary. <laughs> the other thing I looked at in the psalm was, deliver me from the sword, my life from the power of the dog. I automatically went to my dog, Bailey. She was like a nut job last night. She would not let me alone until I got onto the floor. I thought she wanted to play. Oh, no. There was a dog chew, which went under the sofa. So as soon as I yanked it out and gave it to her, then it was, see ya, dead, over. Power of the dog, I guess that's true. Well, anyhow, this is not related to Father's Day, so let us move on. I just thought that would be interesting for your meditation about the meaning and purpose of your life and your dog's life. Father's Day was started in 1913 by an act of Congress, and it was really pushed by two women from opposite parts of the country. Uh, in Spokane, Washington, uh, Sandra Dodd uh, uh, was raised with six other siblings by a single father in, in the early 1900s, and very unusual in that day, in that place. And so she thought that something ought to be done to recognize her father along with all other single fathers. Uh, and then, uh, Grace Golden Clayton of West Virginia, uh, there was a mining disaster in 1906 in Monongah, West Virginia, that killed 362 men and left 1,000 widows and children. And that was in the days before Social Security and pensions and all that stuff. And so between the two of them, they put a lot of pressure on Congress and got people work to, working together to put the heat on. And in 1913, Congress uh, authorized a bill, passed a bill, recognizing the third Sunday of June as Father's Day. And uh, so we've had Father's Day ever since. And uh, I'm sure that Father's Day was entirely responsible for the continued increase in interest in neckties. Uh, because that's a lot of times what, what we get on Father's Day is neckties. Nowadays, things are a little bit different, you know. You might not get a necktie, you might get something, a little goofy fun, you know. Cheap little pocket knife or a little flashlight, and, uh, you know, that's gonna work forever or something like that. It's a boy toy, you know, something little. <clears throat> but uh, Father's Day, it's a good thing uh, that uh, fathers are remembered. And I did not realize this, but on the update of the census in 2015, there's 1.9 single fathers in the country. I didn't realize there were so many. Now there's 9.9 .9 women who are single mothers. So I mean, proportionately, it's a lot different. Yeah, I saw you walking on me, ladies. <laughs> but Father's Day uh, is an important day, and the word father in the Bible uh, really is important. It occurs over 1,900 times in the Old and New Testament, and it sort of coheres around four, three or four themes. Uh, the, first, the first theme that, uh, that's related to uh, fathers in particular is that they are people who are grounded in a relentless love of family and community. Okay? Not just family, but also community. It's one of the themes that goes with fatherhood. Uh, very interesting. Uh, study done by the Baptists uh, in 2003. Uh, and what they discovered through polling and sociological studies and such was that if children come to church first, before the parents, you know, like the Sunday school, only three and one half percent of the families will come to church and belong to the church and stay associated with the church and the development of faith as a way of living. If mom comes without dad, 17% of the children and moms will stick with the church and develop a way of faith and life. They found that if not in 93% of the cases, if the dad was in church with the family every week, 93% of those families all came to church and stuck with it. 
and develop the faith and the depth and the richness of life. So that says something just even in our culture today of the importance for the development of a way of living and a faith in Jesus that really sticks. Uh, all right, now we're going to talk elephants for a minute, guys. Uh, in 1993, uh, Kruger uh, National Park and Game Preserve in South Africa, uh, they were their sanctuary for elephants. And they were so successful that there were too many elephants in the sanctuary. So what they decided to do was to take the young elephants, male and female, children, and transport them to another sanctuary, figuring that they would just develop in natural ways. What they found, now hear this, what they found was that the boy teenage elephants, I'm not sure what age that is for a teenage elephant, they found that the teenage elephants were violent, attacked with no cause, and were sexually promiscuous, promiscuous, including raping elephants, the younger girl elephants. And it got so bad that they were also started attacking and killing the very rare white rhinoceroses that were in that sanctuary. And so the park people were like crazy. They didn't know what was going on. So what they did was to bring some of the male elephants from the other preserve, Kruger Preserve, and within a matter of months, those male elephants had such a marked impact on the teenage elephants' behavior that they, be, they calmed down, they got going, they got organized, and they learned how to live in a community without the violence and without the sexual promiscuity and rape. Of course, you realize what they have done, not realizing that elephants were so social. They started looking at that, looking at us people, <laughs> for obvious reasons, seeing where there are parallels. And you know by this time that there are parallels. So dads matter. Father figures matter. Men as mentors to single parent families matter. Uh, and they're finding that over and over and over again. That to have young people related to men who are relentlessly in love with their families, with their friends, and with their communities are excellent role models. Uh, the second thing uh, that the Bible talks about, and uh, there are several, one of the themes around those 1900 conversations in the Bible about fathers and fatherhood, is that uh, good fathers have an intellectual humility about themselves. In other words, we're realistic about ourselves. And that we pass that on into our family and community settings. You know, I can show the kids where the dipstick is to check the oil on the car now. And I can show them, hey, look at that thing there that says oil. That's where you put the oil if it's low. You don't put it in the power steering thing over here. I can show that. I know how to do that. Most of us fathers are no longer in the position with the sophistication of cars to change out the spark plugs. Some of you can. I can't because I don't have the tools to get under. So, okay, a realistic assessment of yourself. What do you do? Research. And you find the best garage and mechanics that you can find. And show how to do that. And so the other thing is the intellectual humility about uh, the dad's bring to the plate uh, is a healthy pride in yourself and your, your knowledge of what to do but also a good sense of knowing your limits, uh, and also the encourage, encouraging of exploration of life, and doing that by means of both research and exposure to places and people and things in different settings. Uh, and uh, uh, I was uh, reading and uh, saw a Reader's Digest, uh, one dad by the name of uh, Rudy Verdeen was talking about his dad when he was little. 
and his dad owned a fruit and vegetable stand and had all that stuff out on the front sidewalks as well as in the store. And he was six, seven years old, and every time he would come home from school, his dad said, sweep the, front, sweep the sidewalks. And don't forget to get under the, under the displays. And so he would try to hide behind the potato sacks and not get caught. Uh, but it didn't work. His dad always found him, made him do it. And then one day, he found a dollar bill in with the garbage. And so he was very happy from then on to keep doing it. And then, you know, a year or so later, after he kept finding dollar bills, you know, in amongst the garbage, he realized his dad had done that. <laughs> but, but by that time, you know, it was okay. It was okay because he was seeing a gift, a surprise. And that's one of the things that uh, the dads can bring to bring to, to the life of young people, is the idea of enjoyment and pleasure and the surprising things that occur in daily living. And uh, that's what uh, Rudy was learning. And the humility, I know occasionally, Allie, I don't know when the last time you gave me something that would say, world's best dad. Yeah, I just thought I'd mention that, it's been a long time. <laughs> I just want to point that out in front of everybody. <laughs> However, if you keep in mind the Bible theme, about knowing your limits and that yet having pride in what you're capable of doing. I know my limits, and I know if I got a coffee cup that said, world's best dad, I know it's not true. <laughs> it's just not. That's the healthy pride and healthy sense of humility. Knowing your limits and what you try to do as well as you, as you can do. And that's one of the Bible themes. Uh, another one is, uh, is the idea of uh, stewardship of resources, interestingly enough. Uh, what is it that, that we guys teach? We teach that if we get something, we're going to use it. That we usually don't get it to just have it sit around. If you need a new screwdriver, you're going to go get it, and you're going to use it. If you need clothes, chances are that you're going to go get those clothes because you need it, because you're looking shaggy. When I need a flannel shirt, I just put the word out. <laughs> Usually don't have to. I can look pretty shaggy at any time. And there it is. Well, but uh, that's one of the things interesting that the Bible says that men bring to the plate is a, a realistic understanding of the resources and the use of stuff. And not to overwhelm life with love of God with a small g in the form of possessions. That there's no future in it. But the stuff is to be used, not to be loved, and not to be worshipped. The other theme that comes through in those conversations in the Bible about fatherhood is that the Lord reproves the one he loves. Now, reprove is a fancy Bible word uh, that very simply is this. What we're able to teach, guys, is that life, life is painful on many occasions, and it hurts. And we have a realistic assessment of that, knowing that that is going to happen on many occasions. That life hurts, it's painful, it's surprising, and when you get knocked down, you stand up. And if you have enduring pain, you learn to live with it and do the research and the skill building to learn how to go with it and live your life even in the midst and with pain and hurt. You can't get through life without pain. And the Bible talks about fathers as those who do the teaching about how to manage pain. Uh, I mean, how many times I've gone after the kids with a pocket knife to dig out a splinter? <laughs> 
Never successfully, by the way. <laughs> I've always been caught. Always been caught by death. <laughs> but uh, uh, you, you get the idea of, of the teaching notion of that, the realistic assessment, and learning how to use it and live with it. Well, that is the good news that we bring, we men, into our families and into our communities. We bring a very good sense of the use of stuff, that it's to be used and not worshipped. We bring a good sense of what the Bible calls covenant, which is a hard-nosed, hard-headed commitment to the family and the communities in which we live and work and have our being. Uh, a long-term commitment to, uh, to living, even in the midst of pain and tragedy, you learn to work through it and have the skills to live with it and manage it and move along with your life. And finally, to have faith that God loves you. And that's probably the most important. That so long as there's no other replacements, you will have a faith in which you know that God loves you. And that you walk in that way and not some other way. Uh, so those are the gifts that dads bring and male mentors and granddads bring to the children and to the families. The Bible has a very healthy view, a very strong understanding of what it means to be a man. And so we thank God for all of the men uh, and all of the male elephants who continue to do their job. Amen. Um,